Hello and welcome everyone to another episode of Explaining 1960s Fashion. Today I'm focusing on psychedelic fashion. A little heads up, it is pouring outside so if you can hear the rain, I'm sorry there's nothing I can do about that, but let's get into the late 1960s psychedelia. There aren't many styles as distinct for a time as late 60s psychedelic fashion. It felt like in the late 1960s psychedelia was truly everywhere. On posters, album covers, and of course in the fashion. Even if you've never heard of the bands featured on these posters, you will probably most likely know what kind of music they made. Psychedelic rock. But these abstract forms and curly, barely legible lettering that felt so new and different during the time actually wasn't created in the 1960s, but rather came from a celebrated art movement, one that started almost a century earlier. So let's take a step back to the 1800s, a time shaped by a new technology. The intervention of electrical power, telephones, cars, was changing the way the world worked and looked. And some people, especially artists living through this technical revolution, were overwhelmed by the rapid changes. Their once known blue skies were now filled with smoke coming from the factories that were built on the greenery they used to lay on. Out of this conflict, a new global artistic movement was born, one that went by many different names. There were the secessionists in Austria, it was called Jugendstil in Germany, but you might know it under the term Art Nouveau, which is French and translates to new art. Its creators wanted to make art that reflected vibrancy of city life and the beauty of nature. They used flat, decorative patterns, feminine figures and plant motifs, often stylized with fluid, abstract forms. And soon, this new visual language would be applied to just about everything, from architecture to painting to textiles and even beyond that. They revolutionized art and design by believing that aesthetics should go hand in hand with utility and no object was too mundane to be beautiful. This can be seen in many examples, like the subway stations in Paris, or even as simple as the advertisements of the time. With that in mind, let's take it back to the 1960s. The 1960s were a time of cultural change and tumult, an era that brought the peace movement, hippie communes, and sweeping trends in music, art, and fashion. Rejecting consumerism, rebellious youth embraced psychedelic clothing as a creative reflection of the changing culture. Considered unconventional and anti-establishment, psychedelic clothing style design can be seen in fur-trimmed vests, wide bell-bottom denim trousers, flowing caftans, and floral embellishments used on both men and women's clothing. Characteristic features of psychedelic clothing include intense vivid colors, swirling abstract patterns like often worn by Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and like the one that I am wearing today. The epicenter of the summer of love and psychedelia was San Francisco, where hundreds and thousands of young people descended upon the city for protests and drum circles and of course concerts particularly dance concert featuring trippy, psychedelic music from bands like Jefferson Airplane and The Grateful Dead. These bands truly pioneered a new sound of psychedelic rock, which would soon become celebrated all over the world. All these reasons led many young people to travel and move to San Francisco. They mainly went to the neighborhood of Haight-Ashbury, since it had cheap rents and some of the most beautiful parks of the city. This was a working class neighborhood and it was soon flooded by hippies and young people. Before we continue, we have to talk about LSD, the drug that is often said to have influenced psychedelia the greatest. Throughout the 1950s, mainstream media reported on the research into LSD and its growing use in psychiatry and undergraduate psychology students actually taking LSD as part of their education described the effects of the drug. From the second half of the 1950s, Beat Generation writers like William Burrow, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg wrote about and took drugs, including cannabis and benzedrine, raising awareness and helping to popularize their use. 
In the early 1960s, the use of LSD and other psychedelics was advocated by new proponents of consciousness expansion, such as Timothy Leary and Ellen Watts. And according to Lawrence Facey, they profoundly influenced the thinking of a new generation of youth. By the mid-1960s, the psychedelic lifestyle had already developed in California and particularly in San Francisco. And the first major underground LSD factory was established. From 1964, the Merry Pranksters, a loose group of hippies living in the commune that developed around Ken Casey, sponsored the acid test. A series of events involving the taking of LSD supplied by said first factory, accompanied by light shows and film protection, improvised music by the Grateful Dead, which also was financed by said factory and its founder, Osley Stanley. The pranksters helped popularize LSD use through their road trips across America in a psychedelic, decorated, converted school bus, which involved distributing the drug and meeting with major figures of the beat movement, as well as the publications about their activities. San Francisco had an emerging music scene of folk clubs, coffee houses and independent radio stations that catered to the population of students at nearby Berkeley and the free thinkers that had gravitated to the city. There was already a culture of drug use among jazz and blues musicians, and in the early 1960s the use of drugs including cannabis and mescaline and LSD began to grow among folk and rock musicians. Soon musicians began to refer, at first indirectly and later pretty directly and explicitly, to the drug and attempted to recreate or reflect the experience of taking LSD through their music. Just like that, this experience was also reflected in psychedelic art, literature and film. There was always this attempt of trying to make art that felt like taking LSD. This trend ran parallel in both America and Britain and as part of the interconnected folk and rock scene. As pop music began to incorporate psychedelic sounds, the genre emerged as a mainstream and commercial force. Psychedelic rock reached its peak in the last years of the decade. From 1967 to 1968, it was the prevailing sound of rock music, either in the whimsical British variant or the harder American West Coast acid rock. In America, the 1967 Summer of Love was prefaced by the Human Being event and reached its peak at the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. These trends climaxed in the 1969 festival Woodstock, which saw performances by the most major psychedelic artists, including Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Jefferson Airplane and Santana. Many young musicians and hippies came to California, especially San Francisco, and soon the city was flooded with concerts. And there was one major way to get people to come to your concert, a good poster. Back then, these iconic bands were just starting out playing back-to-back -back shows at venues like the Fillmore and the Avalon. And to advertise this new generation of hippie bands, those venues knew that plain typeface and grayscale photos wasn't going to cut it. So they commissioned work from a small group of artists who developed a new formula for concert posters, one that mixed different styles like surrealism, lots of colors, and of course, Art Nouveau. By the mid-60s, Art Nouveau was already experiencing a bit of a resurgence, especially when it came to textiles. Dynamic, floral designs were a natural fit for the hippie aesthetic. Brands like Biva had been playing with the darker, more muted Art Nouveau designs, and a lot of people started to wear vintage clothes again. However, this also inspired some new up-and-coming shops. In London, the most notable boutique was Granny Takes a Trip. Opened in February 1966 at 488 Kings Road, Chelsea in London by Nigel Weymouth, his girlfriend Sheila Cohen and John Pierce. And for eight years it would be a wonderful place filled with bright colors, patterns and the most amazing clothes. By 1974 it sadly had lost its momentum and Granny Takes a Trip was closed. One truly can speak about psychedelic 1960s fashion without mentioning The Fool. They were a Dutch design collective and band in the psychedelic style of art and British popular music in the late 1960s. 
working closely with the Beatles in London, painting George Harrison's mini car, John Lennon's piano, and a three-story high psychedelic mural on the outside of the Apple Boutique on Baker Street, the group was named in reference of the full tarot card. The original members were Dutch artists Simon Postuma and Marika Kroger, who were discovered by photographer Carl Ferris among the hippie community on the Spanish island of Ibiza in 1966. He took photographs of the wonderful, colorful and so outrageous clothing they designed and sent them to London where they were published in the Times. Ferris took the fool back to London and together they opened a studio with the Dutch artists producing clothing and art and Ferris pursuing photography. Barry Finch, a maverick public relations man in the music scene, discovered the couple's talents and working for Brian Epstein, who was also the manager of the Beatles, got them their first designer deals in the industry. Their designs now stand synonymously with the psychedelic fashion of London in the late 1960s. I feel like all of these videos are going to have this portion, but I would like to apologize here for probably saying some words and names wrong. I'm sorry, I'm not Dutch, I don't know Dutch. English is also not my first language, so if there are any words that I say funny, please have some mercy with me, I'm trying my best. Art Nouveau is famous for its feminine figures, most often nude with flowing long hair, which truly resembled the hippies of the 1960s. The war and political changes brought back the feeling those artists had shared so many decades before. The feeling of wanting to admire the beauty of life and nature. And peacocks. I feel like peacock fashion is one of the most wonderful subcultures and substyles of psychedelic fashion. The peacock revolution was a fashion movement which took place between the late 1950s and mid 1970s, mostly in the United Kingdom mostly based around men incorporating feminine fashion elements such as floral prints and complex patterns. The movement also saw the embracing of elements of fashion from Africa, Asia, the late 1700s and the queer community. It began in the 1950s when John Stephen began opening boutiques on Carnaby Street, which advertised flamboyant and queer fashion to the mod subculture. Entering the mainstream by the mid-1960s through the designs of Michael Fish, it was embraced by popular rock acts including the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and Small Faces. The biggest difference between the original Art Nouveau and psychedelic 1960s fashion was the color palette. Instead of Art Nouveau's soft pastel, psychedelic artists opted for intense high contrast colors set to make your eyes vibrate which truly was a reference to the visual experiences of an LSD tripper. And that curly, cloudy, barely legible font that people often think comes from the 70s? Well, it started in 1902 on a poster by Austrian designer Alfred Roller. In the 1960s, artists adapted the bold, dynamic typeface and pushed it even further, softening all lines and obscuring the edges, making it nearly illegible which actually served a purpose. It was meant to grab your attention and keep you interested, at least for as long as it would take you to actually read what was on the poster. The result was a ton of posters that looked like Art Nouveau on acid. Artists such as Janis Joplin, The Beatles and Jimi Hendrix became icons of the psychedelic movement and are known for embracing the boldly innovative styles and fashion associated with this era. I feel like pretty much every 60s band has a psychedelic album. What for the Beatles was Sgt. Pepper was their satanic majesty requests for the Rolling Stones. Every group of the decade would at one point try out a psychedelic twist to their music. Especially for the Beatles, this was a huge step. During the Summer of Love, George Harrison and his wife Patty Boyd visit Hyde Ashbury and their style had clearly changed from their once mod clear-cut looks, they were now wearing florals, patterns and an overall more legere look. As the music of San Francisco spread throughout the world, so did the aesthetic and for a couple of years psychedelia wasn't only a style or a music genre, it was a lifestyle and a subculture, living on the edge of counterculture and the summer of love. By the end of the 1960s the trend of exploring psychedelia in music and fashion was largely in retreat. LSD was declared illegal in both the US and UK by 1966. 
the linking of the murders of Sharon Tate, as well as Lino and Rosemary LaBianca by the Manson family, as well as Beatles songs such as Helter Skelter contributed to an anti-hippie backlash. With the 1970s approaching, styles changed and soon psychedelia became a fond memory, preserved in colorful clothes and wonderful music. Psychedelic fashion was the love child of the hippies and the moths. The patterns and colors united these two styles and mirrored the late 1960s like no other style. Only being popular for such a short amount of time, it stands for the late 1960s, the summer of love and psychedelic rock. A time and memory that had and forever will have a truly special feeling to it. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that this video wasn't as focused on the fashion or not only solely the fashion because I felt like if I want to go in depth about 1960s psychedelic fashion, I would need to explain the entire movement. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. I would love you to leave a comment down below telling me about your favorite psychedelic kind of looks. Do you prefer it with the mod silhouette or do you want to go full out hippie? Who are the people that you really admire? Is there something you would like to add? I'd love to talk to you in the comments. If you did, I would love you to give it a thumbs up and maybe even share it with a friend. It supports me, it supports the channel, and it would truly mean the world. I hope you have a wonderful day. Go out, enjoy the sunshine, take yourself some time to focus on you and your mental health today, and I will catch you in the next video. Bye, everybody.